Hello, dear listener, and welcome back to another episode of Architecture Topics. I'm your host, Liam Karen, and today we are going to be traveling to Florence, Italy. We are going to be talking about a building, which to many marks the end of the Middle Ages in architecture and the beginning of the Renaissance. We are going to be talking about Santa Maria del Fiore and especially about Brunelleschi's dome, completed in 1434. But before we go there, you would do me an immense favor if you could hit pause right now and go follow Architecture Topics on Spotify, Apple Podcast, YouTube, or whichever platform you choose to get your podcasts on. I know it sounds cliche, but this small gesture really helps the show. Excellent, thank you so much. And now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's dive into today's story. Let's start in 1296. Florence was a city flush with wealth. Banking families like the Bardi and the Peruzzi were turning profit into power, and the wool guild, the Arte della Lana, was booming. Politically, Florence was a self-governing republic, proudly independent and often volatile, but determined to show off its success. So they decided to replace their modest old cathedral with something that would better reflect the city's power and status. The new church would be called Santa Maria del Fiore, which in English translates as Saint Mary of the Flower, a poetic nod to the lily, symbol of Florence. The commission went to Arnolfo di Cambio, a sculptor and architect who had also worked on Rome's papal tombs. His plan was ambitious. A three-aisled Italian Gothic basilica, richly ornamented, with a tall nave and a spacious octagonal crossing topped by a dome. The dome was always part of the vision, yes, but initially it was a dome of feasible proportions, buildable with the construction techniques known at the time. So the project got approved, the foundations were laid, and Arnolfo died just a few years later, and the project stalled. Then in the early 1300s, Florence was hit with catastrophe. Famine, political purges, and the Black Death ravaged the population. And for a time, construction slowed to a crawl. But the ambition never died. By the late 1300s, works resumed. Giotto, best known as a painter, added a bell tower, while Andrea Pisano and then Francesco Talenti picked up the main structure. And it was Talenti who made a fateful decision. Probably under political pressure, he enlarged the cathedral's central crossing, the space where the dome would sit. And he did so significantly. Florence was in constant competition with cities like Siena, Milan, and even Rome. And what better way to show dominance than to build the biggest dome the world had seen since antiquity? The fact that no one had any idea how to actually build it? That was a problem for later. When Talenti expanded it, he was just drawing bigger plans. But he didn't propose a method for constructing the dome. The new dome would have a diameter of over 45 meters. That's wider than the Pantheon in Rome, which had been the largest dome built by humankind in over a thousand years, with a diameter of just over 43 meters. And even that knowledge had been lost during the Middle Ages. So in short, no one knew how to build something like that. And so, by the 1420s, the walls of the cathedral were finished, soaring into the sky, but the hole at the top, where the dome should be, was still just that, a gaping hole, and it was becoming an embarrassment. This was Florence, the intellectual heart of Tuscany, the city of Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio. How could they not finish their cathedral? The pressure was on. And the problem wasn't just engineering, it was pride. No one wanted to admit that they didn't know how to solve the puzzle they themselves had created. So in 1418, the city's wool guild announced a public competition. Whoever could design a plan for the dome and make it actually work would win the commission. The race was on. And into the spotlight stepped a man named Filippo Brunelleschi. Brunelleschi was not an architect. He was trained as a goldsmith a maker of fine objects, precision work, delicate things. 
but he was also deeply curious, intensely competitive, and fiercely intelligent. He had spent years in Rome, measuring and sketching the ruins of ancient buildings, and was particularly fascinated by the Pantheon. He wasn't just admiring them. He was trying to understand how they stood, how they were built. And now, back in Florence, he saw an opportunity. Everyone else was afraid of the problem. But Brunelleschi saw a challenge worthy of his mind and his ego. He entered the competition. And what he proposed was unlike anything anyone had ever attempted before. First, he said he could build the dome without wooden centering, that enormous scaffolding normally used to support masonry as it's laid. Florence didn't have enough timber for that, and they knew it. So Brunelleschi said, no problem, I don't need it. Instead, he proposed a self-supporting dome built in horizontal layers, rising like the rings of a tree. Each layer would help hold up the next. And to make that work, he introduced a new brick pattern known as herringbone. Instead of laying all the bricks flat in neat circles, he wove them together at angles, like a fishbone or a field of grain. This helped lock the structure in place, giving it strength as it curved inward. And then came the real twist. He wasn't building one dome, but two an inner dome to carry the structure, and an outer shell to protect it from the weather and give it its iconic silhouette. It was elegant, radical, and terrifying, because Brunelleschi also refused to fully explain how it worked, not until he got the job. If this were any other city, that would have been a deal breaker. But Florence was desperate, so they gave him the job, kind of. They also appointed his old rival, Lorenzo Ghiberti, to the project. The same man who had beaten Brunelleschi years earlier in the competition to design the doors of the baptistery. It was a political move, an insurance policy. But to Brunelleschi, it was an insult. Still, he accepted. Construction of the dome began in 1420, and from the start, Brunelleschi took control. He invented custom machines to lift stone and bricks hundreds of feet in the air, Cranes powered by oxen with gears that could reverse direction at the pull of a lever. Nothing like them had ever been built before. He kept tight control over his methods and kept Ghiberti at arm's length. Sometimes he would even pretend to fall ill just to show that when he was not present, progress slowed. He was making a point. This was his dome. Over the next 14 years, the structure rose brick by brick, ring by ring, without centering and without collapsing. It was a slow, deliberate ballet of engineering and obsession. And in 1434, the dome was finished. The lantern at the top would come later, also designed by Brunelleschi. But the dome itself was done. The impossible was real. Florence had its crown. But Brunelleschi wasn't finished. The dome was closed, yes, but it still needed its final piece, the lantern. A sort of stone crown rising above the oculus, meant to let in light, lock the eight ribs together, and give the dome its vertical thrust. It would stabilize the whole structure and make it soar. Brunelleschi, as usual, insisted on designing it himself. Some argued for a simpler cap, lighter, faster, easier. But Brunelleschi pushed for something bolder, a multi-layered columned lantern that echoed ancient temples. His critics said it was too heavy, too elaborate, too ambitious, but they had said the same thing about the dome. This was fuel to Brunelleschi. Two years later, in 1436, the cathedral was consecrated. Florence finally had its crown. The city erupted in celebration, but the lantern would still take another decade of design tweaks, political delays, and heated debates. Brunelleschi kept defending his vision, detailing not only how the lantern would look, but how to raise the massive marble pieces into place using a system of hoists and pulleys he had custom designed. Then, in 1446, he passed away. 
he was buried inside the cathedral he had crowned. An extraordinary honor in Florence, and a quiet acknowledgement that what he had done was more than architecture. It was myth-making. The lantern was completed a few years later, faithful to his design. And on top of it all, perched at the highest point of the highest dome in Christendom, they placed a copper orb and cross. The symbol of a city that had dared to build what no one else would even attempt. Florentines looked up and saw proof of something they already believed, that their city was exceptional. Not just politically or economically, but intellectually, spiritually, and artistically. This dome, their dome, had done what even ancient Rome hadn't dared since the Pantheon. And it hadn't come from the Pope or an emperor. It had come from a republic, from a community of merchants, bankers, and guilds. And at the center of it all was a man who just a few decades earlier had been carving jewelry. Filippo Brunelleschi became a legend in his own lifetime. His name passed from mouth to mouth like a spell. Not just for the dome, but for what it represented. The idea that reason, study, and human will could overcome even the most impossible challenge. It's hard to overstate how radical that was at the time. In the Middle Ages, architecture had been a collective endeavor. Cathedrals were anonymous masterpieces built by generations of masons and overseen by clerics. But Brunelleschi's dome changed that. It introduced a new idea, the architect as author, as genius. He wasn't just solving technical problems. He was imposing vision, defending ideas, inventing tools, sparring with rivals, controlling every detail, and getting credit. It was a turning point in history. Brunelleschi's dome didn't just complete a cathedral, it launched a movement. Almost immediately, his methods and ideas began to ripple outward. Architects across Italy and beyond took notice. They studied the dome's proportions, its mechanics, and its daring scale. Leon Battista Alberti, one of the great theorists of the early Renaissance, praised it as a feat so impressive that it must have been built not by human power, but by divine inspiration. And he wasn't being poetic. At the time, many genuinely believed that something supernatural had occurred on the rooftops of Florence. Later, when designing the dome for St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, Michelangelo studied Brunelleschi's creation obsessively. He made it taller, grander, more muscular, but he never denied the source of his inspiration. He called Santa Maria del Fiore's dome the work of an angel, not of man. And even centuries later, the ripple continued. The U.S. Capitol Dome. The domes of churches, state buildings, museums. So many are spiritual descendants of that one impossible curve in Florence. But maybe the real legacy of Brunelleschi's dome isn't architectural at all. Maybe it's psychological. It's the moment Florence stopped trying to imitate the past and decided to surpass it. The moment a republic said, we don't need emperors, we don't need ancient formulas, we have our own ideas, our own genius. The moment when faith in God met faith in human reason. So yes, Santa Maria del Fiore began as a Gothic cathedral, but it ended as something else entirely, something new, a renaissance. And that brings us to the end of today's episode of Architecture Topics. If you ever find yourself in Florence, stand in the Piazza del Duomo. Look up at that dome, and remember, it wasn't supposed to be possible. My name is Liam Karen, and I'll see you in the next episode with more stories about ambition, design, and the buildings that shape our world. Until then, keep looking up.